Hi. I'm Rick. We own your lives. You want to buy them back? The saviors, they own our lives. Either they kill you or they own you. And if you kill us, you'll be taking something from them. And they will come looking. But there is a way out. Hey guys, Kiwi here. Today I'll be breaking down and reviewing the most recent episode of The Walking Dead, Season 7, Episode 10, New Best Friends. Warning of spoilers for everything in the show up to 710, and let's jump right into it. So the episode starts out with the Talking Dead sneak peek from last week, which shows Gavin's group of saviors arriving to meet King Ezekiel for another shipment of supplies. The saviors obviously keep provoking the people of the kingdom, just pushing them and bullying them even though they're already cooperating. So Savior Jared, I believe, who gave Richard a hard time back in 702, taunts him again, demanding to take his gun. The savior mentions that bad boys don't get guns, which is true considering that Negan took away all the guns from Alexandria as well. The kingdom has always had a better relationship with the saviors than any other community, but it looks as though that's changing more and more each drop off. So Richard ends up standing off against savior Jared, while Ezekiel tries defusing the situation once again. Richard hands over his handgun, but doesn't cut out the smartass remarks, making the situation even worse. Morgan and Benjamin get involved in defending Richard, resulting resulting in Morgan's Akibdo stick getting taken as well. Gavin reinstates the fact that if they don't smarten up and start acting properly, that Richard would pay the price, ending up just like Glenn and Abraham. This was just another example showing how the saviors can be complete assholes as they continue to harass the people already serving them. As they get back to the kingdom, Ezekiel compliments and disciplines Benjamin at the same time by mentioning that although he's becoming very skilled with his stick, he shouldn't use it before thinking in the future. Then Ezekiel mentions to Richard that they'll talk later, walking away as he calls over Jerry, who also compliments Ben on his Akibdo skills as well. He's sick with this stick, man. <laughs> Jerry! So Morgan tells Benjamin that he wants to speak with Daryl privately, leaving them alone, and their interactions between each other honestly stay very predictable as Daryl gives Morgan a hard time over not wanting to rise up against the saviors, while Morgan continues to stay stubborn towards his beliefs. Daryl seems to share the same opinions as most of us, telling Morgan that Carol wouldn't stand for this and that she would rise up and march to war quicker than anyone else if she knew the full story of what's happened over the past half season or so. This leads us to the scene of Richard asking Daryl for help, along with giving him a brand new crossbow. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. It looks so satisfying to have a damn crossbow in Daryl's hands again, as he feels more and more like his original self, honestly, each scene I've seen him in since his escape at the sanctuary. Richard brings Daryl to his weapons trailer that we saw him have a fit in during 702, loading up with even more supplies, including Molotov cocktails, then Daryl and Richard wait behind that huge trailer on the road as Richard fully explains his plans. He explains that this road is very popular for the saviors to use, and that they're waiting to ambush whatever group of them they see first. They completely wipe out one group of the saviors, and leave them to be found. Richard set up a trail for them to follow, first leading to the weapons closet, and then to Carol's cabin. Richard fails to mention her name, but Daryl starts putting two and two together as Richard describes her as having more balls than the both of them, along with a few other things that would leave him to believe that it is Carol. I left the trail from here to the weapons cache I planted, to the cabin of that someone Ezekiel cares about. Who's that? It's just some loner he met. Why don't they live in the kingdom? I don't know. She lives out there, she'll die out there. It's a woman. What does that matter? She's got more balls than you and me. Richard hoped that Daryl wouldn't care about her, as he wanted to blame her for the death of the saviors that he's planning to kill on the road, leading more saviors to find her and kill her. This would trick Ezekiel into hating the saviors enough to want to fight back alongside Alexandria, and although I agree that I want Ezekiel to rise up, this is obviously not the correct way to do so. So Daryl ends up attacking Richard just in time, stopping him from attacking the group of saviors that are driving by on the road. This reveals Richard to be the one that Daryl was beating up from the Season 7B trailer, as he gets on top of him and starts feeding him punches. As they get back up, Daryl threatens Richard with his life if anything bad happens to Carol in the future, 
concluding all of this crap right before walking away. We'll get back to Daryl later on, but right now I wanted to talk about what we see next, which is the junkyard. This is shown to be the main base of the GPK group that surrounded Rick's group with guns at the end of last episode. We see them all walking out into the middle of the junkyard, as their immersion of numbers is definitely meant to be some sort of intimidation directed towards Rick as he becomes surrounded by them once again. Rick asks to see Father Gabriel first before anything else, resulting in them bringing him out. This shows that they did indeed kidnap him and force him to rob Alexandria of its supplies. The leader of the junkyard group is shown to be Jadis, a very tall hard ass with very few words to go around. The boat things you took got taken. It's all them, so we took the rest. Your words now. Tamiel, Brian, show Rick up, up, up. She suggests that they own Rick's life now, but is conflicted by Rick saying that the saviors own their lives, and what Rick does here is really interesting as he uses being under the saviors to his advantage. This was actually a very smart card to play, as Rick is essentially a savior himself now when you think about it. Yes, technically they are rebels defecting, but they still stand under the hierarchy of the saviors along with their entire network. That being said, Rick explains that if they all went missing that the saviors would come looking for them, and that they would eventually find the GPK, killing them. Rick uses that leverage to ask their leader for an alliance, just like he did with Ezekiel, asking them to join in and rising up and fighting against the saviors. The junkyard group denies this as they only seem to care about what they could gain, and to hell with everything else as they're shown to be truly selfish. Gabriel notices this characteristic about them, using it to his advantage as he manages to steal a knife off of one of the GPK, holding another one of them hostage for the time being. Gabriel explains that the saviors have everything they could ever possibly want, food, weapons, along with anything else they can imagine. This grabs their attention as Jadis tells everyone to stand down. Jadis gives Gabriel a chance to speak, and he uses this opportunity to talk up Rick and the rest of the group, mentioning just how capable they all are. As Jadis grows impatient, she demands that she wants something now, opposed to later. Gabriel continues to back up the capabilities of our survivors, telling the GPK that they could do anything, and will do anything to prove their worth. This puts Rick at a hell of a position, but it's better than nothing. I'd like to consider Michonne grabbing Rick's hand as foreshadowing for an upcoming moment, but we'll get more into it when it comes. As Rick is taken away, everyone else is led to a small sitting area, and this is where Rosita actually drops the title of the episode as she sarcastically mentions that the GPK are their new best friends. Who are these people? New best friends, I guess. Rick is led on top of the junkyard, showing us a view of just how big it truly is. Jadis tells Rick of their motto, that they take and they don't bother. She considers changing this, but she wants to know that Rick is worth getting involved with before she agrees to anything. She pushes Rick down the hill of garbage that they're standing on, throwing him into almost an arena of sorts with a crazy berserk zombie. This is the same zombie that we've been seeing in the previews, and we finally get to see Rick fight it. This thing reminds me of something straight out of Z Nation, and I honestly don't mind the idea, as I always enjoy new original ways to show zombies in The Walking Dead. Michonne spectates through a tube as she watches Rick run away from this thing, finding anything he can use against it. As this spike zombie attacks him, he's actually stabbed through the hand as he puts his hand on its forehead, pushing it away and giving him more time to collect his bearings. This is the moment I was talking about that relates back to Michonne grabbing his hand due to concern. Looks like she had a reason to be worried after all. So Michonne yells at Rick, telling him to use the walls of the arena to his advantage, and Rick does just that, pulling down the trash bags, which actually starts a mini avalanche, knocking down the spike zombie, which gives Rick an advantage. He continues to cause things to fall on that zombie and then he grabs a shard object and proceeds to stab the hell out of it, defeating it and decapitating it. Rest in peace, Winslow. Jadis seems impressed by this, dropping down a rope for Rick to get back up with. They discuss terms of their agreement, including how much the GPK will get as a reward. All that we learn before she leaves is that the name of the zombie that Rick fought is called Winslot and her name is Jadis. Rick tries asking more questions, conversating with her, but she lacks to give any more useful information as her way of speaking is meant to feel distant and intimidating. 
I'm sure she doesn't actually speak like that, and that she's just putting on some sort of act like King Ezekiel. But either way, Rick leaves the junkyard with Michonne and everyone else, smiling as he tells them the good news of their new alliance. Father Gabriel begins explaining to Rick what exactly happened and how he was kidnapped. Jadis was angry that they scavenged the boat and got away, so she got Tamil, I believe, to follow them back to Alexandria, jumping Gabriel at the pantry and forcing him to drive away with their stuff. It's funny how the person who kidnaps Gabriel is actually the same person who Gabriel holds hostage, bringing it full circle in a way. So Gabriel thanks Rick for coming out and searching for him, along with believing in him and not assuming that he just ran off like the coward that he used to be. When Gabriel asks Rick why he was so confident with the GPK and why he was smiling, he just says that someone taught him that enemies can become friends. This is obviously Gabriel himself as Rick used to hate him a season and a half ago. So as our survivors are getting ready to leave the junkyard, Rosita starts picking a fight with Tara over the fact that she doesn't want to go back to Alexandria. Rosita wants to go out searching for the guns that they need to get for the GPK, mentioning how she'll scavenge them from anywhere or anyone as long as it helps them gain soldiers. And so Tara is actually faced with an awkward moment with Rick as he jokingly tells her to at least tell him where not to search making her think of Oceanside. And right before they leave, Rick takes a junkyard cat statue as a gift to Michonne, replacing that rainbow cat that she got with Carl way back in episode 312 clear. This was a clever thing to throw in at the end, and I love how the show ties in little moments like that to previous episodes and seasons. So that pretty much concludes the junkyard storyline for this episode, so let's go ahead and jump on over to Carol. She opens her door to King Ezekiel, accompanied by a few soldiers from the kingdom. Ezekiel gives the excuse that they were just clearing the area for walkers for her, mentioning that she was the one who opened the door. His excuse quickly falls flat as he tells her to wait so Jerry can give her some cobbler, and honestly, this is even getting annoying to me at this point. Take a hint, Carol doesn't want your damn food, dude. How many times does she have to refuse before you take a hint? I'm sure if she became starving, she'd eventually crawl back to the kingdom asking for something to eat. But until that happens, honestly screw off and stop giving her food and stop using those gifts of food as an excuse to talk to her. And as much as I'd hate to continue ranting, sadly nothing interesting happens between them as she just tells them to leave. I was hoping that she'd invite Ezekiel inside and that he'd maybe even tell her about Rick and how he came asking them to rise up, but nope, we get absolutely nothing as they just walk away per her request. Go. Ezekiel could have asked Carol of her opinions on the situation involving Alexandria and what she believes is the best course of action to take. It would have been interesting to have Ezekiel bring up Rick and group completely unaware that she used to be a part of their community. I was really interested in how this would make Carol react, especially after this episode, but we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. So although we don't see that, we do see a different conversation involving Carol that I think we've all been waiting to see. Carol gets a knock on the door, and it turns out to be Daryl. We get a heartwarming reunion between the two of them, as Carol immediately becomes overwhelmed with tears. Daryl gives an excuse on how he found her not quite ratting out Richard yet. He mentions that Morgan said how she was gone, and that he just saw her out there and came to see her himself. Daryl stays for dinner, as he's shown sitting at the table waiting to eat while she's explaining herself. She tells Daryl once again that she needed to leave because she didn't want to kill anymore. She feels like all of the murdering that she's done for the good of her people has really messed with her, as it would really mess with anyone. And so the first time in a long time, Carol shows an immense amount of emotion towards the people that she cares about, asking if everyone at Alexandria is okay. I really feel like Daryl can understand her at this point, as he can see how broken she is inside. I suppose he just couldn't bear to put her in a worse mood as he lies to her, telling her that everyone back home is okay when in fact that's not the truth at all. Daryl knows just as well as we do that when Carol finds out about Glenn dying and Abraham along with Daryl and Eugene's imprisonments, that she'll turn into a badass assassin Carol again. He doesn't want her to do this because she clearly states to him that if she were to do that, there'd be nothing of her left afterwards. 
And so let's briefly take a look at an exclusive interview from Talking Dead that actually shows Norman Reedus explaining just that. She needs to hear that everyone's okay. And I lie to her and say everybody's fine because she needs to hear it. She's going through her own thing. And if I tell her otherwise, she's going to want to fight. And that's the last thing she wants to do. She's trying to find herself. And I realize that she needs to hear that. And so I tell her what she needs to hear. I care so much about her that I don't want her to come fight and get hurt and and her up basically so they finish having dinner and Daryl leaves I want to think that he stayed there half to just visit her and half to protect her in case Richard went through with his plan once they were done visiting and it was clear that Richard didn't he left and went back to the kingdom next we see him visiting Shiva as Morgan approaches him saying how good he is with her Daryl tells him that he found Carol in the house causing Morgan to admit that he only said what he did because she told him to. Daryl understands, instead focusing the subject on getting the kingdom to rise up with Alexandria. Daryl tells Morgan that he's gotta make it happen, but Morgan explains that it can't be him being stubborn as ever. Daryl tells him to wake the hell up and do something, leading Morgan to explain that there's a reason why he hasn't yet. That reason is the same reason why Daryl didn't tell Carol the truth about her friends dying even though I really wish that he would have. The episode comes to a close as Daryl leaves for the hilltop to get ready for war the next day, leaving Morgan and Richard to have a standoff staring competition as they watch Daryl walk out of the equation. So what is Daryl going to accomplish exactly at the hilltop? I know that he said that he wants to get ready, and by that he means that he wants to get ready to march to war. But why does he need to go to the hilltop for that? I imagine Gregory won't be happy to see him if he does, and Daryl was safe staying at the kingdom in the first place. Let me know what you guys think about all of this in the comments section below, but that's pretty much it for today guys. If you've enjoyed anything I've said in this video, feel free to leave a rating on the video as it definitely helps me out. And thank you all so much for watching, until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out.